Hello and welcome back inside the park for May for podcast number 783. This is Todd. No, Todd, not now. AKA Negative Camber. Tonight, for your kind consideration, we're going to be talking about fishing on the banks of the Missouri River somewhere between Lexington and Wellington, Missouri. No, we're not going to talk about that. Although we should. No, we're going to talk about Formula One news because it's off race weekend and we talk about Formula One news. It gives us a chance to unpack the sport, which is what we're going to do. But before doing that, I have to introduce my guest, of course, which you know what that means. That's exactly right, folks. Nestled in our nation's capital. You know her. You know who it is. The lovely, the redoubtable. Grace! Grace, how you doing? I'm I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing physically? Uh, okay. I miss that. You know, that's the one downside of not ever doing the race reviews is that I any know. sort of like inside joke that comes up, I'm sure you have already played that joke. But yeah, that's like my new favorite question. How's your so. chassis, Grace? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good. I didn't wreck it. Yeah, Maybe. right. That's right. I, I'm not Charles Leclerc. I didn't wreck it. I know. And boy, did the world have a heyday with Martin Brundle. Okay, yes. so folks, for those that are newer to the podcast, so I live in, in like in Missouri, in the middle of America, in a, in a city called St. Louis with the Big Arch. So that's where I live now. But I was really born and raised in Kansas City, right? Not Duluth, Minnesota, in Kansas City, all right? And so when you're born and raised there, you know, your blood is red because you're a Chiefs fan your whole life. So I know who Patrick Mahomes is. And when he was trying, it was Martin, poor Martin. He's been told yeah, that it was you right. know, Patrick Mahomes. And he, you know, Martin, didn't, what does he know about the Kansas City Chiefs? Come on. Right. So he's down there, you know, hustling down there trying to was like, that's not Patrick. Yeah, that's not Patrick. Nope. That's not. And he got up there and, but he handled it like a pro. But everybody had their, you know, just absolutely teed off on him. And I feel bad because I think he's, you know, he handled it really well. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't think the, I think the, the whole summation of the grid walk wasn't yeah. necessarily handled well. Maybe that one snippet of the grid walk yeah. wasn't handled well. Yeah, yeah, it was unfortunate. Yes. And then I, I don't know, I just saw Marshall Pruitt just absolutely tweeted. I mean, he just went after him on well, it. He's like, uh, well, it was unfortunate. So, so here is what I don't understand. As if anybody wanted my opinion on this, too bad you're going to get it. Um, one, he clearly doesn't enjoy this. There's no. clearly some time in his life when he enjoyed this. Now is not that time. So I don't know why Sky still makes him do it, right? Then it's like super jam packed at Miami Gardens, right? Like, yep. and I've been, I'm sure you've been in big crowds too. Like you don't get a choice. You can be like, I want to go that way. The crowd's going that way. Too bad. You're all yeah. going that way, that right? Way. Like yeah, exactly. that's the way the crowd is going. That's the way yeah. you're going. You can't go upstream. And so yep. he's kind of in that kind of a situation that you kind of are like, you're going that way now, right? I hope we can loop around again. And then I just don't know why he doesn't have a, like a nicer entrance. Like, okay. So I don't know who this person is. So, you know, it would be easier to go like, hey, I'm Martin Brendel first. Because that's the other thing, too, that I think people don't understand is there's like 7 million Martin Brendels. Like, we watch Sky. We know Martin Brendel. To us, it seems like there's one. But there's like every country has its person. So that's like the 17th person that tried to interview yeah, Serena. Right. And she didn't know who any of them are either, right? Martin Brendel's, you know, Sky Sport. Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Like, why does he just go for the like rudest question possible as his entry i don't like i mean i think we've all been in that situation where you're like I, again i was just at a conference where you're like shoot i know this person they're familiar right so you kind of have to have a way of going not like who the hell are you right like that's not the way you enter into that conversation so i just think that there's probably a nicer way to kind of fill that like you're important because there's lots of people around you and you have bodyguards, but I don't know who you are. And this guy in my ear doesn't know who you are. Just to like, hey, tell me about how it is. Are you enjoying Miami Gardens? Have you seen the sights? Have you been to the beach? Like, there's so many other ways to start a conversation that aren't just, well, I guess you're important. Who the hell are you? Which right. seems to be his go. And, uh, Although the dude he talked to that he was like, well, let's just say I'm a social media. Oh, yeah, so right. he goes, oh, and modest too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, I mean, was so I did good. enjoy that, right? Like, yeah, it was I, so I, good. I, there is a place for his sarcasm, but I just think yeah. that if he's going to keep 
doing this and especially in a place like that that's really crowded and isn't full of racing people i think that's the other yeah. thing too right like most of the like when he does a grid walk in catalonia there aren't going to be like jam-packed with people who have nothing to do with motorsports it's going to be right. mostly people he knows or like oh that's so and so's mechanic or you know yeah. like he has some connection to well him. i would much rather hear those interviews and and that's and and as far as his grid work i i would much rather martin just go talk to yeah. the drivers teams mechanics team bosses i i don't i i really couldn't care less about the celebrities because the celebrities yeah. you know i you know i'm sure there are some celebrities that have been following it for years and know it really well but most are there you know as a sort of brand building Correct, exercise right. and so that's not really adding anything i really don't nothing against serena or venus or you know who whoever i i their take on the race i'm not really interested in i am however very interested in total wolf's take on the race right you know? yeah um so yeah anyway not i think to get on a segue, i think it just... but that's well, yeah. it's not really a segue. It's a race that just happened, and this happens to be a Formula One podcast, and I don't get to do the <laughs> race shows. So when there's something I want to talk about, i got to get right. it in on the off weeks. But I just think they should either find somebody else who enjoys doing this or change it up and either just focus on the racing people or find a better intro with the people you don't know who they are except that they're important. Go. You know you know what would even be more hilarious and awkward is to have Ted, Krav Ted Kravitz do it. I think, but Ted has just that like a would natural. Be hilarious. He has like a natural charm to himself that, like, he does. You know, you know, which Martin Brundle is more of the like dry wit, sarcastic kind of guy, whereas like Ted Kravitz just has like a jovial funness yeah. to him that I think would work. But I also thought he was going to die when he, uh, what was it, qualifying when he ran down the escalator. I was like, Ted, I you know, know there has to be another escalator because all these people have to get down and they're not yeah. going to get down the up escalator. I can't believe right. they didn't stop them. Like. Holy cow. I know. He ran all the way down that whole escalator. And as, the camera guy with the camera, the, too. The I cameraman. I was just like, oh, my <laughs> gosh. You're crazy. Gonna I just love it when – I just would have loved to have seen Pete's face when Ted just goes, are you going to do this? You all right? Okay. <laughs> gone. Right? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I just always it think great. it's – It's always great. I love, I love Ted's notebook. I'm glad that I get to watch him legally. And, uh, and I do always love when Pete loses him. That's always fun, too. Yeah, yeah. Like, that's always fun. Ted's Ted somewhere – it's like my mom. He's just wandered off somewhere. Something caught his eye, and he's gone. Right? Yeah. And now Pete's, Pete's over there poking his camera in the door of the Williams, you know, yeah. hospitality suite, and Ted's over at like McLaren's tires getting cleaned. You know, it's like, wh right. where'd you go? Right. No idea. Yeah. Like, oh look, there's right. Michael Andretti hanging out with Red Bull. Where'd yeah, Ted go? Nobody funny. knows. Yeah, Nobody funny. knows. Good stuff. Well, the Miami Gardens Grand Prix. Yes, that uh, that was a. I That's will a say, toddling town. I will say also, every time somebody said, this is my first time in Miami, if they left the space, it was like a Rocky Horror Picture Show. I always added garden. Yeah. Like it was, I really like being here in Miami gardens, you know, yeah. like, because you're not in Miami. You're not at the beach. But um, hopefully people like Pierre Gasly, they're just like, oh, this is my first time in Miami. This is great. Like, this isn't Miami, man. Please yeah. go go to South Beach. Go to Miami. Well, in fairness to them, none of them stayed in Miami Gardens. They were all staying down, you know, in well, that's Miami. Good. Yeah. So that is good. Uh, what are you gonna do? I don't know. I just think, you know, it was just it was just exactly as I expected, which is disappointing. You know, I prefer like the Imola Aww. the Imola Sprint race, right? Like really? Aww. Aww. Poor Miami. Your crappy track with your painted, Aww. you know, yacht seat. Like, you know, I really think they should have invited Kimi Raikkonen. I think that would have made the yacht scene awesome. Like, just Kimi sitting in a gorilla on the suit. Yeah, right. Like, just sitting yeah. on one of the yachts. That would have been great. Um, yeah, your your boring street track wrapped around a stadium. Yeah, not that great. Surprise. Mm. Supplies. Yeah. So you know, Austin. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, the hype machine was there and the turnout and all that. Oh, I mean, yeah. they did a great job of the promotion side of it. But I don't know that Austin has a whole lot to fear in no. the sense that Austin's got a proper purpose-built racetrack. But, but the but, thing but, is... But, but I will say, Las Vegas could learn a lot, though, here. Right. So I think that's the thing is that Vegas... Because Vegas, we talked about this in the last podcast I was on, was that Vegas knows how to put on a show yep. in a way that Miami Gardens may not. So and I sometimes think, to a fault. I mean, they, they they can overdo it in a big hurry. Well, you know, it's it, they do have, like, you know, gondolas in the middle of a casino. I mean, right? Yeah. 
So, I, but I think that if you get Vegas is, I think Miami Gardens should be afraid of Vegas, right? Because yep. I could see that Vegas could pull off a boring race really well in a way that Miami Gardens just didn't pull off. Um, a see, if I, really well. if I was Bobby Epstein down at, at Coda, I would start a marketing blitz that Formula One in America is great. You got the Miami Grand Prix, Las Vegas. And then when you're ready to see a real Formula One race, right. come, come to, to Austin. Austin. That's right. When I you're agree. done with the schmaltz and the glamour and all the glitz and all the pomp yeah. and circumstance and all the, you know, the tchotchkes and the little baubles and overpriced T-shirts and you're ready for a real Formula One race, come to Austin. Although they had a lot of glitz and glamour at Austin as well, so. Well, I, well I've been three times. I don't know. Paul and I enjoyed the donkey that was well, there. Well, I'm just saying this last nice. time they had like anybody who was in the NBA at the race. Oh, right, right, right. You know what I mean? Right, like, you right. know, it wasn't like Miami Gardens, but that was his first run in. That was right. Martin's first run in with Serena was at Austin. There were a lot right. of people there. Right. Yes. So, yeah, right, uh, right. You're right. The one year I went, I wouldn't have called it like, oh, glitzy and glamoury, like, no. you know, Vegas. But I think that last year they really made a concerted effort to do that. Right. We saw right. George Lucas. That was like the only celebrity we saw that first year. Yes. Yes. And Esteban Gutierrez. Is he a celebrity? In some people's world, yes. Oh, that's nice. Yes. His mom's just like Nick Heidfeld. That's right. right here. You know. Yeah, see? Hey, that's right. My cup that Grace got me. Well, Grace, I thought this week we could talk about Lewis Hamilton. Sure, why not? Because, you know, honestly, there's not enough people talking about Lewis Hamilton these days. No, nobody talks about him ever. Nobody, ever. Nobody. He's, he's like, nobody says a word about him. That's all people talk about. I know, and including whole... himself. He's wow. a prolific social media user. So well, he has to be, you know. I mean, well, right? you know, it's part his of the game brand. Um, so we're game. gonna talk about Lewis. Yes, we're gonna unpack all that is Lewis Ham. Lewis Hamilton, as you've never seen him, we're gonna talk about Lewis Hamilton. So the reason we're gonna talk about the header for this section of my notes is Lewis's edge. Are we seeing a changing of the guard, or is Lewis just having an off season? That's what we're gonna talk about because that's what everybody else is talking about. So I thought we, you know, who wants to be left behind? So I thought we would talk about it. So no doubt Lewis has had a tough start to the season. And when you combine that with the fact that despite the reasons, and there are numerous, George Russell is leading the Mercedes effort in points and results. So this has begat questions to start to circulate as to if Lewis has lost his edge. Now, while not directing his comments specifically at Lewis, former F1 driver and legend Jackie Ix said, quote, age is incredibly important in racing. He told this to Rick Winkleman of the Zigo Race Cafe. Way okay, to go, all, Rick. All of that is great. It is. Ah, I'm Rick Winkleman of the Zigo Race Cafe. I love Excellent. the whole thing. That, that's great. That's his. That's Rick's brand, and, and is he is brand. on brand. Good for yeah. you, Rick. Uh, he continues, quote, You can't beat a Verstappen, Leclerc, or Norris if you are already over your top. Once you weaken, it's very fast, much harder than the rate at which you grow. What is important is that he still wants to fight. He will definitely win uh, some more races, but he doesn't have the time on his side, end quote. No, so, I, you know, it's a measured comment about anyone in a sport that as they get older, I think it's a relatively measured comment. I don't I think, think it, it was, is, I think it's know. true. It is true of all of us. Yes. It's just that it happens later for the rest of us. Yes, because the, you know, the, well, I talk about that. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry. I, you no, know, no, no. I, I only read fine. enough of the notes to kind of get a flavor. You yeah. Know? You get the vibe of what I'm going okay. after. Right. And then, you okay. know, you, you spin up your machine and, and have your talking points. So there you go. Right. now, before you get too defensive on Lewis's behalf, while I don't think he's lost his quote edge, eventually though, everyone does lose their edge and the yeah. guard has changed and that happens. And I recall hearing a very similar comment to what I just read back in 2011 
when Schumacher was at Mercedes, fellow German and huge idol of Grace's, one Heinz Harold Frensen. Because they have no history, the two of them. There's no, no, no history. Why. HHF would be disparaging towards Michael Schumacher. No reason at all. For new fans of F1, why would there be some animus between the two? I don't know. <laughs> so okay. anyway, Heinz Harold uh, had this to say about Schumacher at the time. Quote, as you grow older, you tend to hesitate and become indecisive whether or not to push and take risks. You lose precious tenths of a second. I think Michael is at that stage in his career, end quote. For, that's that's pretty rich coming from somebody who, you know, I guess in like normal, like in current drivers, right? That would be yeah. like um, Nikita Mazepin telling Hamilton he's like too old for this game, right? Like, I think that's Well, just maybe a, not Nikita. It would be more like... Um, I was trying to think of who's a good back marker reference. Like, uh, um, it would be more like... Of the current grid, maybe yeah. Valtteri or Sergio, maybe. You think Harold Harold Franson is as good as Botas or Perez? Well, he's there or thereabouts. I mean, he had some pretty damn good races at, at Jordan. All right. Yeah. I, I think it's somewhere a little lower than that. I, I Okay. Can't... All right. But anyway, I just so because if people don't know who he is, why why I think that's rich is because Michael Schumacher, even when he went to Mercedes, which didn't work out really well for him at, at all, um, you know, it's kind of weird for somebody who is like maybe the, you know, 14th, 13th best driver on the grid to tell somebody who was once the best driver on the grid that <laughs> eh, maybe it's time to hang it up. Uh, yeah. Maybe you should have hung it up before you even got started, sir. Right. <laughs> Suffice it to say, Heinz didn't have Schumacher's career. Sure success not. yeah uh but it does sound familiar it's also what was what they said about senna and prost and lauda and raikkonen and alonzo and vettel and you get my point you know these are these are sort of you know i mean kimi just retired you know for the last couple of years you could see people think eh, just, i don't know i mean you know Kimi's a great driver but you know he's not doesn't have his edge he's not in there like you know he used to when he was younger and that kind of thing and so him retiring was probably no big shock but uh but you heard this and this goes back decades right um now not that my opinion matters uh in the least to lewis or anyone else but if you ask me i'm more inclined to suggest that perhaps lewis hasn't lost his edge but i do wonder a little bit if he's lost his focus and desire Right. Kind of hard to go through uh, the end of last season and still keep the, you know, the the energy and fire up after last year's controversy and this year's car issues added to, you know, and let's be fair, you know, as he's gotten older, Lewis has uh, a lot of personal causes that he feels are very important in his life. I think, you know, you, it'd be hard to have that focus, you know. Um, now, if you asked Lewis, I'm sure he would tell me to go pound sand because he worked his butt off during the off season to prepare. And that may be very well true, but it wasn't enough, whatever he did, because he's not beating his teammate, um, you know, and that's a reality. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I, I you, you don't win seven titles and then just you know, forget right. how to drive. Right, right. He totally knows how to drive. He's an incredible race car driver. The The question is, is, is it like his edge because of his age? I don't think so. I just, for me, it just seems like there's a lot going on in Lewis's world right now, you know? And I don't know. How do you, how do you feel? Do you feel that way a little bit? I mean, it's, I'm just speaking from personal opinion. It'd be hard to go through the controversy of last year and not have some of the stuffing knocked out of you. Right. And I think especially when you're not doing well in the following season. Right. I think exactly. that's the thing. Right. Yes. I, again, I think that's true for all of us. It's it is much easier when you're like, wow, that didn't go the way I thought. And then your next project is a great success or you get yeah. kudos the next day from your boss or whatever. It makes that uh, not that project didn't kind of roll the way I thought it was going to work out better. It's a lot right. harder when that like dip is a sustained dip. Right. It's a lot harder to kind of. Um, you know, rise above it and go, 
Yeah, that's in the past, right? So I yeah. think that, right, if they weren't struggling this season, he would have a different perspective on how last season ended, right? Like, oh, well, Nico won one. Verstappen won one. I'm going to win the next 72. It doesn't matter. But that's mm-hmm. clearly not the case this season, right? He may never get another championship well, if they don't. And F1 is cruel that way. Yeah, and we're about is. to go. We're about to go to um, Barcelona, and so that's, you yeah. know, that's where all the chips are going to happen. If they, if Mercedes walks away from Barcelona, and we don't see some major upgrade, or you know, they don't start to see progress here real soon, they're really sunk until summer break, and that's yeah. just how that works. And so, I, I. You know, if I, I mean, there's a part of me that's like on pins and needles. I mean, you kind of always are going into Catalonia, not because of the race. The race is usually pretty boring, but because of what everybody brings, right? This is, you know, the big upgrades. And if you don't start to see success at Catalonia in the next couple of races, they're really going to not make much out of this year. So, yeah, I think, I think, I think you're hard. right, Grace. I think there's a combination of, you know, you could bounce back from something like that if you, if you hit the road with success but hitting the road with a recalcitrant car that is struggling to be best of the rest is you know that's just compounding things i you know the thing about lewis when i think about lewis in in aggregate he's a brilliantly talented race car driver he's got seven championships and he's a wonderful driver Mm -hmm. um you know in the past there were a lot of rivalries in the sport that kind of at the time they defined the sport i i think of fangio versus ascari or sterling moss uh sure. lauda versus hunt prost versus senna mansell versus senna senna versus schumacher hockenden versus schumacher schumacher versus alonzo vettel versus alonzo right harold frenson versus Hyde harold frenson versus the world um, you know, those are very famous sort of head to head rivalries, interteam rivalries between drivers. But when you look at Lewis's career in, in balance, he had a tussle with Raikkonen in 07, 08 with Massa, yeah. but he won. Um, and then with Verstappen last year. But apart from that, he's really had only his teammate to consider. Such was the dominance right. of that Mercedes. So there weren't these big rivalries in his career like the other champions of the past. And I'm, I'm, it's not marginalizing his achievement. He beat his teammate. But, you know, there, as such, it's a brilliantly envious position as the team leader. And the focus was all behind him, as it should be, right? So if I'm Toto, all my chips are behind Lewis because the guy is wonderfully talented. Right. And he's going to win races as long as you give him a car. So, But I think... When people point those kind of things out, you know, if you get really ardent uh, Lewis fans who who do feel like he's the goat, you know, they get very defensive about that. And I don't, I'm not, like I said, I'm not trying to take any wind out of his sails. I'm just saying that that's a different situation than a lot of the other champions faces faced in that head-to-head battle. Um, and perhaps because of that situation with the teammate being his closest rival for a good portion of his career what may be difficult now is for toto to continue kind of quasi playing down george russell's performance while trying to retain lewis's lead role in the team and that becomes even more difficult if lewis has sort of lost some of his focus or or whatever or maybe just as disenchanted right so there's a very difficult dynamic there grace where you're you know, at this point, he's been the clear dominant leader of that team for eight seasons, and they've won on the trot eight seasons, and really his only competition, save versus last year, was his teammate, and now you're in this year, and your teammate's winning, yeah, you know, I, and it's a difficult situation. Yeah, I think part of it is, too, is that um, you, so usually when you have a, you bring on a second driver, it is because it's the person you want to mold, right? And so you still think Lewis is great and you're bringing in the new guy so they can kind of like learn from Lewis, right? Well, that's like Alonzo with... Hamilton at McLaren in 07. Right, or yes, well, that that's exactly how that worked too, right? And so, well, you know, I was thinking more like Michael Schumacher and Felipe Massa, right? Like yeah. that, that, you know, he was there to bring in Massa so that when he was, not that that worked out that way either, but then when, you know, Schumacher retired, the idea was that Massa could be their guy. So, um, but George, 
isn't here for that, right? Like he already got all that those teething pains out at Williams. He's he's over this, and he's also Toto's guy too. So I think that Toto has to be balanced not only as a team man, you know, as the team manager, but also as a as the driver manager as well. It's because he can't have George walk away either, right? Like mm. if George is like, screw you, I talked to George, you know, I talked to Christian Horner and I'm out. Whoa, Toto's really in a pickle then. So oh, yeah. I think in some ways it's a harder, um, Toto's in a harder place than that that kind he of a is. person is usually because usually you're like, oh yes, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, play to the superstar. And the other guy's like, oh, it's okay. I'm new. I'm a rookie. I got a year. And George just isn't going to play that game. And so that would be the worst thing that would happen is if both of them walked away. But certainly if George walked away, that is not what Toto has in mind. So mm -hmm. he kind of has to play it so that both are happy in a way that I don't think he had to play with Rosberg or with Valtteri Botas. No, he didn't have to do that. Rosberg just, you know, kicked back and, yeah. and Valtteri, you know, was a consummate team player. So I think in a lot of ways, you're right. He's got this difficult situation to manage. And sometimes it's dis think back um, when Schumacher retired. Mm -hmm. Massa was there. Raikkonen was possibly up for the taking. Um, and at the time, Luca de Montezemolo made the decision to right. part ways with Schumacher. It was unfathomable that they would part ways. Now, Michael, you know, they let him come out and say he's retiring. But in reality, uh, Lucas said, mm -hmm. you know, we got to look at the future. Well, and this is Michael was battling, you know, yeah. hammer and tongue with Alonzo at the time. He for was not on the back, the back no. slide at all when that happened. I think we were no. all. I mean, I remember like that was yesterday when that came out, yeah. you know, in the, during the season. It was like, right. like. I remember just like texting people. Uh, we probably called people then. But anyway, like having some form of communication with people like. Am I in the twilight zone? Did you yeah. just see what I just saw? Really? Like that just seemed like the craziest thing ever. Cause he was not, mm -mm. not on the backslide at all. No, he wasn't. Never. And, and it, it was a difficult situation forced by a lot of different factors within that team. And, and at the time, Raikkonen was kind of hot property, right? And right. Massa was supposed to be the guy. Yeah. Now Schumacher couched it as he was stepping down out of, some sort of magnanimous, yeah. you know, effort to give Massa his fair chance. And that's nice, but that's wasn't the real reason. And so yeah, right. sometimes as you describe Grace, there's short term, there's long term, they've won eight titles with Lewis. Yeah. They've got George there who is the next phenom. They have to retain George. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I've been a little surprised so far this year that Toto sort of try you know not whether he tried or not but it just comes across as he's playing down what george has done um I think he has to yeah but you got to be careful to your point because mm -hmm. george's only gonna put up with so much of that crap right. i mean you would you know? in a functioning in a functioning relationship which i don't know i assume they still have that but in a functioning relationship what you'd want is all right george it's your first year we're not going to stop you from racing but you know i can't just be out there being like oh you know you're not, you know, Lewis is not my guy anymore, right? Like, so I, I assume that George is in on the plan. But I think that's the other thing, too, is that maybe George is willing to put up with it for a year, but certainly not two or three years, because just like any other driver, he is also acutely aware of, like, his peak performance. And if he doesn't win a championship in the next five years, then he's going to be Lewis Hamilton. And everybody's yeah. going to be like, oh, you know, this new young guy that came in. And so I think that Drivers especially are acutely aware of, like, my narrative now. I mean, that's why when you're talking about, like, Lewis and his brand, right? Like, every driver has to have that because they have to be able to sell themselves because they have to believe in themselves because nobody else is going to. And if they're going to be successful, they've got to convince all these other people that have money that they're successful and you should support yeah. them. So Well, it's it's George true, and been, I think... George has been playing that game. I think that... I think that's... George could write a PowerPoint presentation mm -hmm. on how to say a lot and say nothing and how to just really make everybody at the team happy and everybody around him. I think he's just played the like PR game, you know, like chef's kiss perfect. And so I think that's yeah. really going to be hard if they don't start turning in his direction here real soon. I do too, because if I'm George, if I'm, you know, his agent, mm -hmm. I'm telling, Hey, you just came in and you're beating him five out of four. 
you're you're beating a seven time champ and the whole goal for you is is to knock Lewis's feet off the desk at Mercedes. Right. You know? But also, just like I brought up the Schumacher retirement thing, because sometimes those team dynamics force the hand of the team. Mm -hmm. And they parted with a seven-time champion. It was unfathomable yeah. uh, that they would have made that decision, and yet they did. Um, and sometimes keeping George, that's the long-term future for that team. For sure. And so you've mm -hmm. got to, to your point, you can't keep playing all that down and acting like, ah. You can't do that. The guy's, he's, he's the one carrying all the water for that team right now, regardless of what's going on in Lewis's yeah. world. And it's a dog eat dog world. Mm -hmm. George can say, Oh, Lewis is great. And I'm learning right. so much. Oh hell. He wants to blow Lewis into the weeds. Absolutely. But I guess that's, I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like the George just plays that so well. He does. He's, he's got yeah. that PR thing worked out so well. And then I think yeah. the other thing too, is that, you know, um, not that teammates have to be buddies or friends, you know, beyond like unboxed videos, but you know, in real life, he doesn't hang out with Lewis. Lewis is in his group no. or generation of people. So, no, um, I think, I, I think that if, if Lewis doesn't have this year successful, maybe next year, I think he'll just go. I think we'll have yeah. had enough. I don't and know. We'll just I just, seven. you know, for me, and I'm not just picking on Lewis here because I, I, I put Vettel in the same camp for me. I, I think, think Lewis and Vettel seem to have a lot of other things going on in their lives that legitimately are important to them, be mm -hmm. it family or social causes or whatever it might be. I feel like those things are at this age and this season of life. I think those are ultimately more important to them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and they know this, that winning F1 titles takes a singular focus where yeah. nothing else matters at all. And in that sense, you can see the new class percolating at the top of the sharp end of the grid, like Leclerc, Sainz, yeah, Verstappen, yeah. Norris, Gasly, Albon, Ocon, you know, even Guan Yu Zhou, who's new, you know, uh, Mick Schumacher or, or, or Piastri, who's up and coming. These guys all have one goal, one. It's singular. That's all they think about, you know, is, is winning races and winning championships. And, you know, I, I don't, you know, I didn't see that anymore in Kimi, and you know, granted, he wasn't in a in a race winning Kimi, car. Kimi, Kimi but... never. Kimi's an outlier. I don't think he fits. This he is an outlier. He's You're right. He's never been that way, and there'll never be another Kimi. And so I think right. that. Right. It's just. I don't He's know, an outlier, but he was able to do it. You know, it's it's kind of the way it is. You know, mm -hmm. it, like it or not, in the end, the baton will be passed. He'll just be overcome by that wave. He will. He will it it and i really do sort of get that sense of that's what's going on we'll talk about that next but the baton will be passed mm -hmm. the big question now is is that time now is right. that now or is it just an off season the guys just having a bad season they'll figure it out and he'll bounce back and and be awesome next year i don't know i think but that's what everybody's debating yeah, for sure. And I think that it's so much harder in racing than anywhere else because it's so much about the car. I mean, what do they say? Like Formula One is like, what, 60% the car, 70% the car? Like, yeah, right. Unlike any other sport, it's such a big chunk of what makes you successful is how mm -hmm. good the car is. Right. And so Lewis may not have, by whatever metrics Lewis uses, not fallen off at all. But that car has fallen off by the metrics that we can all see. And so I think that's the thing that... Well, the he metric becomes about... a teammate, right? Yeah. No, I mean you're right, but even even his own his own self. So yes. Um, I, I think that he could still say, you know what? Based, I'm I, you know, I work in data, so I'm making it, you know, some scientific metric that I don't think he has. Maybe he does, maybe he doesn't. But like, you know, he can still run, you know, a a, a lap around the track at this speed, the same speed he ran before. I'm still the same person. George can run it faster, and the car sucks. Yeah. You know, so he knows whether or not the car is going to unsuck or not in a way that I can't know. Right. And that we won't even get a hint at until we get through Catalonia and we get through summer break. And maybe at the end of the season, we can say, okay, yeah, next season the car will be better. And then he has still 26 to figure it out when everything changes again. But if they get to the end of the season and the car is a dog, he, he may fare well just say, yeah. I'm yeah. out. This isn't going to be better for me. And I don't want to leave because that's the other thing too, right? Nobody wants to be Brent Favre leave on a high note, right? Don't wait till you're falling apart to go. Um, so 
Yeah, there's a part of me that thinks you know, Lewis doesn't want to wait till like summer break and say, "Yeah, I'm retiring and go out with not a lot of fanfare." No. I mean, he's he's a he's a social character. He loves the yeah. adulation, and I would think he'd want to swan on swans on season, oh, yeah. you know, so every race could you know celebrate him and that kind of thing. But yeah, um, yeah. So next up, we're going to talk about Total Wolf, Mohammed bin Salim, and Michael Massey. Okay. So. There were a few reports this week that the FIA president, Mohammed bin Salim, has, and if I'm pronouncing it wrong, apologize, I'm American, that's what we do, um, has suggested that former race director Michael Massey may get a new role within the FIA, and this has sent shockwaves through the Mercedes camp with Lewis allegedly having, he was you know, astonished and shocked, and he was having a series of urgent calls and messages with his closest advisors, when he heard that news, now that's all in the press. You know? I mean, that also doesn't surprise me. Like, um, I don't know. Let's say um, I hated Paul Charsley, which I don't. But for the example here, let's say we did. And you suddenly were like, okay, Grace, you don't get along with Paul. We're not going to have him on the show anymore. And then suddenly you call me and go, oh, just kidding. I'm going to have Paul on, but he's not going to actually be on the show. He's just going to be like the behind the scenes editor guy. Yeah, I'm going to send you a few text messages because I'm going to be very upset because clearly you didn't give a shit about what I have. Sorry. Right. You, get, you don't care about what I have to say here. So right. I don't think that part, I think I'd be more surprised if Lewis was just like, oh, yeah, that's fine. Bring Michael Massey back. I don't care. I think I would be more shocked at that because clearly he was wronged by Michael Massey. Like the race did not go the way. It should have gone. I, I don't mean that as like a, a, I don't know, right? Like that that decision was not, not a right decision. I think that's how I've always felt with it. I understand how he got there, not the right way to go. So I think Lewis texting people is normal. I think I would be very upset if I didn't like Paul and you agreed that we didn't like Paul and we weren't going to have him on the show anymore. And then you had him on the show again. I think that's right. very normal. Hey, Paul, just FYI, we do like you. I know. I, I prefaced yeah. it with that, but I was trying to give some like, <laughs> Some example here. I mean, I didn't do so good with the, uh, you know, Hyde Harold Frenson example. So, <laughs> no, I, you know, you were there, thereabouts. Yeah. You know, so I think that I don't think that, I mean, I get it. The news, we have to, I, I, I don't know. You always give me a hard time because you're just like, here's this great headline. And I just go, no, that's dumb. Let's go to the next thing, right? Like, <laughs> I, I would be terrible in this job because I'm not very good at like spinning the like 72 sentence yarn about this. But yeah, yeah. I'd be more surprised if you're like, Oh, yeah, we asked Lewis about Michael Massey coming back, and he went, eh, that's fine. Whatever. I would be shocked yeah. by that. Well, it, it was suggested in the article that Total Wolf himself uh, was a major critic of the whole situation and not that's in favor of Massey's rehabilitation or restoration within the FIA, and he made that known to Ben Selyam. He read um, my email. Yes, right. <laughs> so what's interesting and perhaps more telling to me when I read mm -hmm. all of this, and given the recent jewelry gate issue, is that it's becoming very clear that Ben Salyam mm -hmm. is reestablishing the FIA's power base in the triune leadership of Formula One. I agree with that. That, folks, is what's happening. It's yes. the, the jewelry is just a very small part of what's going on. The bigger plan. Mm -hmm. Yes, the bigger plan here. And if you're new to Formula One, you will have not known this. Um, but I'm going to give you a couple things to kind of uh, think about and go look. And you'll kind of and hopefully it'll explain uh, what I'm talking about better than I am. Um, but that's exactly what's happening. So these decisions, um, while everyone was was completely apoplectic with the final race of the season and their you know na gnashing of teeth and hand wringing and road ripping right. and all that going on, very quietly the FIA held an election, retired Jean Tot, and hired a brand new president. He is not Jean Tot, and everyone is starting to get a little surprised about this jewelry thing what is that they're making a lot out of nothing and they're a little surprised but massey what what are you talking about i mean that's ridiculous that's because you're used to jean tot and his sort of docile approach to these things the fia you know really whether it's right or not it seemingly lost a lot of its power base over formula one right and so that's quite a departure under the tot rule of the FIA. And so I think Ben Salyam is is 
getting that power base back. So in a quote in the Daily Mail, he said uh, regarding Lewis about um, this whole situation, he said that he doesn't want to fight but that he's simply aiming to restore the FIA to its rightful position. Nothing more, nothing less, end quote. Um, a source in the article said, quote, over the last few years, the FIA has been marginalized and Ben Salyam wants to return it to the old role. He doesn't want anything himself financially or any other way. He maybe feels that Toto has gotten a little ahead of himself. It's not up to Toto to run Formula One, end quote. That is what's going on. Yeah. I mean, I think if you if you look at the history, right, I, even the recent history. So, you know, you had Bernie running the com – that's great, Mikasa. Everybody wanted to see that. Uh, you, you have Bernie Eccleston running the, you know, commercial side. And he worked very closely with Max Mosley, right? Yes. And so we talk about, right, the, the uh, you know, Iron Fist and the Velvet Glove and the like. But they worked in partnership to get what they wanted. And then you brought in Jean Todd, who really didn't focus on the racing side of it at all, right? That's he right. really went road safety and he just really didn't get involved in this side of things. And so, right, so now you have the new guy comes along and he's like, here's how it's going to be and here's how it's going to work. And I agree that right. he is. He is, I'm, I, I only have things I can't say on the podcast as ways I would phrase this, but he's trying to figure out who's the biggest guy in the room and that's what he's doing right now. And so yep. anything he can do to get that. And unfortunately, most of those things are going to involve Lewis because, you know, uh, Lewis is also a pretty, pretty big name and catches everybody's attention. So, um, I agree that it really isn't about. Uh, they're friendly fire, right? Jewelry. Yes. You know, the the pants. I was trying to, what does Ted call it? Pants and piercings. Pants and piercings is, yeah. a, you know, friendly fire. You know, whether or not Michael Massey comes back, that's friendly fire. It's really about making the point that I'm in charge. I'm the big that's man right. in this room. That's not right. you. No, you, you know, get back in your swim lane. I know you enjoyed it under Sean Todd not being in your swim lane. Right. But, uh, you know, scoot back over there. Liberty Media. I, I'm I'm the boss. I'm in charge. That's I right. also think, um, I also don't find it surprising they want to bring Michael Massey back. I think much like you know we talk about race car drivers and how there's like a very, you know, narrow amount of people that could do this job. You know, beyond even the 20 people that fill the grid, but even at that, there's like, mm -hmm. I'll say 50 people in the world that could do this job. Like it's a crazy slim amount of people that could really be a formula one driver i think that's true in many of the positions and right. um losing michael Ma i'm not saying make him the race director but losing everything that michael massey had and all the brain trust that is michael massey i wouldn't want that either i think if there was a way to bring him back in some role um he was good at something that got him to be race director and i wouldn't want to lose all of that just because he made one really bad decision right mm -hmm. there has to be um i guess in the same way we kind of talk about like a Vettel or you know david coulthard or jensen button like you keep some some drivers older drivers on it at older right 38 you keep these veteran drivers on at your team because they bring something else to your team even if it's not on the track so even if Vettel never wins another race he may really bring something to aston martin that makes stroll better or makes the team better right you know, right, that um, he has knowledge. He's been to the playoffs, if you will, that, you know, often in the NBA, that's what you do is you bring in a veteran who's been to the playoffs to help your team get to the playoffs because he right. knows what that experience is like. And so it's the same way. Michael Massey's seen some things, and it might be helpful to have him on my side so that I could learn from the things he's seen, even if he'll never be race director again. Well, yeah, and as for Massey, I mean, regardless of how you feel about him, um. You know, it's worth keeping in mind that redemption is a process some people value a lot and others don't. Right. Right. But also keep in mind that it wasn't too long ago that Pat Simmons was implicated in Renault's crash gate. He yep. was banned from the sport, literally thrown out of Formula One and banned from Formula One. And he now holds rank in F1's technical group and was uh, instrumental in helping the design of these brand new cars in 2022 with Ross right. Braun. So back in 2008, 09, you may have been furious with Pat Simmons 
for instigating the crash gate, right? But right. and he was banned. But he came yeah. back and he gave us these cars, right. you know, with right. along with Ross Braun and that technical team. Because he's so, a smart guy, right? And so you don't Yeah, wanna, he's a wickedly smart guy. Right. So you don't so, want to just throw all the baby with the yeah. bathwater. So I so I, I agree. You know, as 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 controversial as Massey, Massey's you know race call was that that you know uh, hampered uh, Lewis. Uh, Pat Simmons rigged a race, yeah. an entire right. race, right. you know, by purposely having a, a driver purposely crash and bring out yellows so Alonzo could go on and win the race. Right. I mean, pff, wow. Yeah. Um, so, so keep that in mind about, you know, redemption and reconciliation and those kind of things. You know, maybe but you're I... not a big fan of those things, but um, some in F1 clearly are. As <laughs> for... I also think that there are two different perspectives, right? Like, I think that yeah, there's the president's perspective. And, you know, again, Michael Massey just happens to be the person to get him what he wants. Yeah. So if you've read uh, the, uh, one thing to think about um, if you're newer to Formula One is that Max Mosley, uh, rest in, in peace, um, had a uh, did an autobiography. And it, it's a really good, interesting read. Um, and so if you've read that, if you haven't, it's definitely worth picking up, as is Jackie Stewart's and, and uh, Murray Walker's, by the way. But um, it's a really good read. And you'll know from reading that just how strong the FIA's position was in Formula One right. and how much of that has had disappeared under Jean Tut's leadership. And there were moments, remember, Grace, that we were scratching our head when things would happen soon after Jean Tot, first year or two, and yeah, Jean Tot was there. And we joked. I mean, the guys, like, just disappeared. You know, we're like, well, right. where is Jean Tot on this issue? Right. Why isn't he weighing it? Because we were used to what Max Mosley would have done. This is the guy yeah. who penalized McLaren $100 million, right, right for Spygate. So, and it, it helped that where Ben Sayum, I you know, he's a former rally driver and that kind of stuff, but yeah. Max Mosley was a barrister, right? So he knew the political and legal side of this. And right. so they had a really tight grip on Formula One. And I think that's where he's trying to get back to, right? Yeah, um, and, and um and clearly Liberty Media doesn't want to give it back. Right? Like they have well, yeah, because, you know, I kind of feel like Liberty came in, brought Ross in, brought Pat Simmons in, and pretty much kind of put Jean and the FIA in a box, yeah. you know? Like, okay, we'll take it from here. We're, we got the commercial rights, and I'm pulling together some of the geniuses of the sport to rewrite the technical regulations because, you know, and you guys just sit Focus over there and over worry there. about sustainability and right. road safety. Road safety. Whatever you worry about those things over there, yeah. right? Like, right. we're... we're right. Yeah. So now... The FIA, I would say, as much as I'm predicting the whole engine rule regulations coming is a big deal in Audi and VW and all that, this is also a big deal in Formula One. Mm -hmm. The FIA reasserting a more powerful role and oversight of the sport that it governs contractually and how much of that. I would submit this, him coming in in... In the whole grand scheme of things, I think there are people within the paddock that have had a butt full of Mercedes, Toto, and Lewis. And they're kind of done with the whole thing. And I think him coming in here and saying, I don't care if he's a seven-time champ. That's against the rules. No other drivers can wear jewelry. He's going to do it and follow the Formula One. We're the regulatory body, and that's how it's going to be, you know. Um, and Toto can you know, s s try to swing a big stick and carry a lot of political power in Formula One. And I think this is, uh, you know, trying to get him to stand down, basically, and put him in his place. So watch this space. That's just kind of I, my hunch. I do think as well, I, I do think that Michael Massey was, you know, like all the team principals agreed to him being out. Like we talk about Toto Wolf, right? That's the clear... Yeah. big mouth in the room but it's not like anybody else ran to his defense you know the other nine guys weren't like mm. you know front toast. I think there were a couple i think there were i think there were some that said it was kind of unfortunate and yeah i you know they because that was a political hand grenade to go in and have a full-throated support of michael massey 
but I don't think they were dancing about on his grave either. I think they were just saying, yeah. I think that I, I think I guess what I'm trying to get at here is that there is more to Michael Massey's tenure than just the last race at Abu Dhabi. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so I think that I think that's what leads people to say, well, okay, maybe not Michael Massey anymore. Right. So yeah. maybe if like Toto Wolf is a 10, I feel like I'm just trying to make bad analogies this whole this whole podcast. But like <laughs> if Toto Wolf's a, like a 10, I hate that guy. Get out of here. You know, and one is like, I love this guy. Keep him in. Right. You know, maybe there were a lot in the like fives and sixes. Yeah. But I guess I didn't hear a lot of ones and twos. And that leads me to believe that, you know, there's a lot going on with Michael Massey, of course, that we don't know. We're not pervy to. We're not, you know, in the inner sanctum of Formula One. Right. And even though Toto Wolf is the loudest mouth out there, other people, you know, perhaps were like, Meh, you know, not so yeah. into this guy. Um, and I also think it'll be interesting to see how um, friend of the podcast, Stefano Dem- Dominicali, kind of like, balances this whole thing because kind of like how we were talking about with Toto Wolf having to kind of like balance between George and balance between Lewis I was Dominicali kind of like you know he's kind of the like bridge guy that's kind of got to get all these people together and moving the sport forward and I th- that's the person I think is interesting to watch how, what he's going to say and how he's going to kind of like work the FIA's agenda but also Liberty Media's agenda and kind of, yeah. kind of make this magic that we watch every two to three weeks kind of work yeah it's going to be interesting to see the dynamic it really Mm -hmm. is Uh, because you have the one power center which is is all the teams individually you've got formula one liberty media and commercial rights with stefano and then you have the regulatory body fia so it's going to be very interesting to see uh what happens there um next up in the news nick devries young dutchman phenom is going to be in Spain. Now, listen, if you're a fan of Nick DeVries, and who isn't, right? Uh, then the, he's the reserve Mercedes driver, then you're going to be very happy to know that he's getting some F1 seat time in Spain this weekend running in free practice one for Williams. Not Mercedes, but for Williams. Yes. So he's going to be doing that. So that's right. The Dutch... F2 and Formula E champion will be getting a run in Alex Albon's car, his Williams, on Friday. So I got to reading that. Oh, that's great. You know, that's really cool. Nick and, is, unless, is. Unless you're Latifi, this is very great. Yeah, right, right, right. So I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is great. Um, you know, Nick's getting a shot, getting a little seat time yeah. in F1. So on one side of the coin, you'd be right in thinking this is a great opportunity for Nick. And that's very true. This is, uh, you know, this is great. But there's another side of the coin as I got to thinking about this more. And I was thinking, well, okay, so wait a minute. He's a Mercedes reserve driver. If he was going to get seat time in free practice one, why would, why would Mercedes call up and, you know, put lean on Williams to give up Alex Albon's car for free practice one? and not just have him drive George or Lewis's Mercedes. So I was thinking about it that, well, okay, that's interesting, but, um, I'm, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen in Monaco. Should Lewis decide that he isn't going to take his nose ring and earrings out for the race and his five watches. Yeah. Right. And that was mandated by the FIA. Right. Um, and so nobody's really sure what would happen. They could tell him he can't drive. Um, they could just fine him and dock his license points. And then after a couple races, then you get sat down. I don't know. But it, I'm not quite sure what's going to happen there. I might even suggest that this out of nowhere running in a Williams suggests that even Mercedes aren't quite sure what Lewis is going to do. So they're going to prep their reserve driver and get him some F1 seat time over at Williams just in case. Now, mm-hmm. I mean, that's just being prudent. I'm not knocking them, if I'm honest, but it is a little odd that they would work a deal to get Nick in the seat at Williams ahead of the Monaco Grand Prix. Why would the team not have... I don't know why would they not get him in a Mercedes, right? Um, 
And they worked this deal out right before Monaco. And then it starts to me thinking, well, surely wouldn't the team know what Lewis is going to do? And it would suggest that Lewis is being very mum about the whole thing. And that's also very difficult for the team if, if they don't know kind of what's going on. And so much so that, that did they have to heat up a deal with Williams to get some seat time and set Albon down so they could get some seat time for the reserve driver just in case Lewis decides not to take his jewelry out? I don't so know. Do you think this has nothing to do with Latifi? Um, no, I'm not saying that either. Okay. It, it I could think have. Maybe it, there's it, some bonus. I just yeah, think that, like, it could oh, have. Latifi. He ain't doing so good. And so if they can replace his money, they might be wanting to replace him as a driver. And this would be a way to see, eh, you know, what might somebody it, else do? It, and it, Yeah, it could be. Sometimes drivers also, like, you know, I, again, I will reference Jensen Button. When did he raise the best? The year his contract was up. Always. So right. maybe Latifi needs a little, like, you know, hey, buddy, it's not so safe. Maybe, you know, light a little match under that and stay away from the walls. I don't know. I mean, I see your point, and I, I agree. I can't, I can't fathom that Toto Wolf has no idea what Lewis Hamilton's going to do. I, I, I just can't. Like, I don't know. That just seems crazy to me that he has, would have no idea whether or not his driver was going to show yeah. up at Monaco or not. Well, that's what I'm wondering because I think it could be Latifi. But then I was trying to recall. Is it Jack Aiken or Roy Nassani or somebody is Williams' reserve driver? So why wouldn't they be looking at one of their guys? Instead of looking at a Mercedes reserve driver, why wouldn't they be looking at one of Williams' own reserve drivers as a potential replacement for Latifi? You know that Jost is a crazy guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I so, mean, you're, you're right. I guess I just think that, and maybe it's just a, maybe it really is about Lewis and that's just an extra bonus, right? Like it doesn't certainly hurt to kind of like, you know, sharpen Latifi up a little bit, but it's really about Lewis. And that could well, be. I, I just wonder, I'm, you know, I'm just spinning yarns here and conspiracy theory. You know, this is tinfoil hat stuff. You know, we're, we've, we've officially got into the tinfoil that's, hat stage. That's the best part but, about Formula One. Don't I worry. know, but I mean, if asked, Mercedes would play the whole thing down. It's like, oh, no, we're just getting some seat time for Nick. You know, this is great. As um, will Capito. He's not going to say, oh, yeah, Nick Latifi's trash, so we're trying to replace right. him. Right, yeah, right? they're like, going to play it all down. Right. Yeah. No, but we I just saw this young guy. We want to give him some experience, yeah, get him some seat time, seat time. You know, get him ready for the future. Yeah. Right, right. But I just, I don't know. I just found it awful odd, and the timing of all this is just different. Um, oh, and yeah. I was just trying to connect dots that perhaps clearly aren't there. No, uh, like but it. watch the space. We'll find out. I could be way off base. You're, but Either way, we're just, you know, Charlie Day sticking the, yeah, that's right. the board, right? And so Although I, think, I will say that there's probably a lot of Dutch fans out there that are going to love to see Max and Nick yeah, sure, uh, why racing not? together. Why not? And so, yeah. yeah, we won't really know. I guess I just thought it was, I just think that Lewis has a plan. Like, I get it that, um, right, uh, a piercing isn't, like, especially a nose piercing, right, isn't just like, boosh, just take it out. It's not like earrings, right? Um, but the team has, I, I just can't imagine that somebody hasn't solved this problem. This is a solvable problem. Maybe not the day of, but you've had three weeks, sir, figure out a solution, um, to what you're going to do. And, um, yeah, I, you know, he's taking it very personal and well, I don't know. I mean, that's a whole nother aspect of the story is whether or not it's a, a personal attack on Lewis. Right. And so, um, but even if it is, I still think he could have a plan and decide not to do it, which is, I guess, kind of, you know, one, one yeah. of the other yarn pinpoints is that he could solve this problem, but he chooses not to for his own reasons. But I still can't believe he's just going to go rogue and not tell the team because the team could can him. Yeah, I just think the entire narrative, though, I've kind of watched this now for the last couple of weeks. The entire mm -hmm. narrative seems to be a bit of a wind change and it's kind of blowing against Lewis at this point. With now you got teams boss team bosses weighing in, commending the FI for their stance uh, on the jewelry issue. Even the head of the GPDA, your friend Alex Vertz, said that it's oh, yeah, it's God. the right thing to do. You know, you're setting an example for young drivers. It's the right thing to do. 
Um, it is dangerous, and there's a host of reasons for that. Um, and so I kind of see this bit of a sea change. I don't know. I, I don't when know. you when you take a stand back, you stand back and look at everything that's going on, and George, uh, you know, uh, beating him, and Lewis, and then last year, and Mercedes, and the regulation change, the struggles at Mercedes. You've got these power struggles with the FIA and everything. And now you're starting to see, and it's like I said a couple of podcasts ago, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world in Formula One. And if any one of those teams and drivers get a slightest sniff that Lewis is, is struggling, they're going to kick the living crap out of him when he's down because that's sure. one less competitor they got to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. So that's... Yeah, that's what they're going to do. So, but I do I, think Mercedes would know what Lewis is yeah. going to do in my I mean, uh, I think the other Maybe thing, too, know. is that, I mean, I guess because we can't, unless you're Carlos Sainz in the stew room, we don't know what kind of underwear they're wearing, which is the other half of this discussion, right? So yep. um, there seems to be less controversy over whether or not they're wearing the right underwear. Um, but you know, that's part of this issue too, that it they're is. also claiming is, is a safety issue. I don't know. Pierre Gasly is just like, well, I'm just not going to wear them anymore. All right. And so more power to you, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know who's, who's going to check that. But I think the thing is, is that it's a very visual piercing, right? So yeah, his right. nose and his ears, we can all see that. Whereas underwear and, you know, nipple piercings or belly button piercings or any, any other body part, somebody chooses to get pierced that we can't see. Right. Um, what would that what would that statement be you know right somebody else would have to check those things so yeah it's know. yeah it's 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 a weird thing um oh let's see uh recall that ferrari didn't bring their upgrades a couple races ago and miami only saw a few things but the bigger upgrade package is coming this weekend in spain and i loved it that the mild-mannered team boss matteo bonato actually said now it's our turn uh, directing that towards uh, Red Bull. And I thought, all right, Matia, get in there, mix it up. And, uh, you know, he's trying to take the fight back to Red Bull. He says this weekend they're coming with the upgrade packages. Now it's their turn. And he even sort of intimated that Red Bull might be burning through their cost cap on a bunch of upgrades. How's that for Ooh. little mind games? Ooh, I was going to say, this, Matia, is, this is the part of Bonato we like to see, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. Now, of course, it's still delivered in a very, like, um, muted understand tone right like you could read this yeah. as like take that it's our turn now red bull you're just burning through money that's not how he said no, it i think no i thought they really um no. in the beginning of drive to survive where they were trying to get bonato to do stuff and whoever was with him was like he's not that guy yeah, yeah he's not that guy he's so not. no uh, he's it was not. still a very polite conversation i'm sure but i do like you know i like this this uh uh, I will use the word feisty Bonato, right? The winning yeah. Bonato is willing to kind of stick it to the other team. I know. He hasn't been able to do in the past couple of years. So I agree. Yeah, right on. You tell, them, you tell them, Red Bull. That's you right. You're winning now, but you ain't got no money. That's right. You got no money, and we're coming with upgrades. That's, That's exactly right. right. Because we're, we were a mid-pack team, so we got more time <laughs> than you did to do all right. this like wizardry. And, That's uh, right. Here we're now kicking your butts. I agree. All right. It's time for Alvin's Cats. That's right. This is where we talk about nonsense, literal nonsense, and occasionally Alex Albon's cats. All right, Grace. Do you have anything for Albon's cats? So this is not related to anything Formula 1 because I've kind of already covered any sort of random things that I wanted to insert so far. Um, mm. Except that, did you, so did you know that the owner of the Dolphins made more money off of, this, off of the Miami Gardens Grand Prix than he has off the whole Dolphin season? <laughs> Ross that's is like, hilarious that is the, like literally why i why thought i thought they i else? read that they lost money this year well i mean maybe the dolphins lose money maybe it's all relative right yeah, they just lost more money off of the grand prix than they do off of the dolphins i mean it is the dolphins but um anyway uh there was that and that um i like that not only was the dan marino statue featured and, and the podium but dan marino himself came so yeah I think he should, like, if I was, now see, this is why Dan Marino is a better person than I am, but I would have been, like, pointing to my statue, like, see that? That's me. I'm that guy. <laughs> right? Like, I'm bigger than all of you. Do you have a statue here? Right. No, but I, I do. That's me. Um, but I did want to notice, so I've been, I've been to Chicago many times. You've been to Chicago, right? I have. So I just spent a week in Chicago, and I recently learned about this delightful treat that I had never heard about before. So have you ever heard about rainbow ice cream? Yes. 
What? Where has this been my whole life? This was delicious. <laughs> it it was is. Delicious. It was delicious. It is good. All right. So, um, it's uh. Wait. Now I have to see if I can recall all five layers. Right. So it's chocolate, strawberry, Palmer House, which I'm not sure what flavor that actually is, but it had little maraschino cherries in it, pistachio, and orange sherbet, and they're all kind of like slabbed on top of each other. Yeah. It was. It was delicious. It's um, delectable. So, yeah, I mean, I'm not, the deep dish pizza is not really my thing. We did have some because people oh. wanted it. You like, I, I don't know. It's no, I, I, I'm, I'm in St. Louis. The St. Louis style pizza is like super yeah, thin. Yeah, right. So, right. I prefer. And cut in squares. Right. So I, I prefer thin crust, but you know, people yeah. like the deep dish and who am I to be like, you guys, boo, whatever. So yeah. we did get some deep dish and, but then we got rainbow ice cream, which, um, again, I, I highly recommend. So next it's time. It's a crap pleaser. Check it out. It's delicious. Yeah. Yes, it is. All right. Well, my no shit headlines for the week are, I don't have many. Uh, the first one is uh, Sebastian Vettel claims climate change is forcing him to consider retiring from F1 despite traveling world in jets. Sounds like a conundrum. I, I feel like there's. I, I feel like the first half of that is the headline, and the second half of that headline is like a personal jab at him. Was there a semicolon in there? Like I don't know where. No. I don't know where the punctuation goes in that? Yeah, but, um, I know punctuation's important. I mean, especially since he was very open about the fact that, like, I know y'all trying to get me with this, but I do think about the fact that I am trying to be environmentally conscious and a Formula One driver, and then yeah, um, there's something to that. But I also think. This is his biggest platform, right? So if he wasn't a Formula One driver, would any of us give two craps about what that Sebastian Vettel dude no. was doing? No. So um, I think it is laudable to take your last few years in the sport and you know push causes that are of value to you and to the world and um, use your platform wisely. And I also think that um, it's not as big of a, like... Uh, I don't know conundrum as people like to think it is. I think I work, I work at a, a job. You work at a job. I'm always trying to make my job more efficient. I always want to make it better. If some if some technology comes out that makes a better survey, we should be doing that, right? Like I think that you're always trying to look for improvement. So if there's a way to improve Formula One in a way that makes the sport sustainable and yet not Formula E, then yeah, Sebastian Middle is going to be all for that. So yeah. Always push so there you go. But that's a weird headline. I agree. It is. Uh, Lando Norris hits out at crap Miami Grand Prix circuit after its F1 debut as he calls the track surface just terrible. <laughs> I feel like not reading, like not reading them, like just hearing these headlines makes it even more confusing to figure out. I know. Because I can't read it like three times going, what part am I supposed to hold on to? Right. There's like you just read 12 words and the only words I needed was Lando Norris track was crap. But I know like 15 words in between those two clauses. That well, it's this whole thing. You know, it's it's it's, you know, why I'm always ranting about how, you know, journalism lost art now. But it's, uh, you know, it's because every social media, everybody's trying to jam in the entire story into the headline. And it gets I mean, it just turns into one big word salad. Um, why not just write? Lando Norris thinks the Miami Grand Prix track was crap. Yeah, because then, you know, but, uh, okay, would anybody go, unless they pointed out that he really didn't like track service, and, oh, what was wrong with the track service, right? So, you know, Miami a... makes crap, Miami, Miami makes crap race using this one weird trick. You know, maybe that's, maybe that. I don't know. I just think that um, it's asphalt. It's a parking lot. I don't know about you, but I've driven in parking lots and even in Florida where the weather doesn't change every five seconds. So the roads are better. Uh, it's still a parking lot and I expect it to be crappy. I don't drive. Well, it through, is. I don't ever drive through a parking lot going. Wow. Wow. It's like the Autobahn. This is amazing. We should have it's a race amazing. here. Nobody said that. No. The other headline, Charles Leclerc crashes Nikki Lauda's iconic 1974 one million pound Ferrari into wall at Monaco. You know what? I think. Mm. So you know what that was? That was. Uh... Yeah, the little the little uh, mm. ski slope guy just went right off the top. Yes. Of the first bid. So right. I think we were talking about why are they bringing in Nick DeVries to run a free practice one? 
Maybe it's Lewis. Maybe it's Nikki Latifi. Maybe it's Charles Leclerc and Monaco. And maybe that too shouldn't be in a car because, boy, that has never worked out for him. Yeah, he's he's had some tough tough Yet goes again. at Monaco. So yeah. just let's just like take Leclerc out for a race. He can go. He can go hang out at home and watch the race. It's not like you know he has right. to go very far. Hang out on a yacht or something, and we'll give Nick DeBreeze a, a little shot. There you go. Why not? And my last headline is Daniel Ricardo and Lando Norris open up on wild party antics. Dash trashed the whole floor. Netflix are real bunch sound like. Yes, they are, Dan. There you go. They had a party. They're like, which one of them was Keith Moon? Oh, I think it's I think it's Lando Norris. <laughs> You're probably right. See, because okay, so nobody asked for this, but now I'm gonna tell you this because I can. So everybody's like, oh, you know, Ricky Ardo, he's a funny guy. What I don't think people realize is that Ricky Ardo is a funny guy, but he uses that as a, a tool to jab people, right? Like it's Rossi and calling Jorge Lorenzo George, right? It is a yes. it is a mind game. It isn't just like, you know, Paul Charsley is a funny guy and we go out and he's, oh, ha, ha, ha. He tells great stories. He's a good storyteller. He tells great jokes. That is not what Ricky Ardo is doing. He uses his humor as a way that you don't notice. Like Netflix are real bunch of sound like. Right. Yes. And so because joking is an easy way to pass stereotypes and negative negative criteria, because if you tell a blonde joke and I go, Todd, I'm blonde, I'm offended by that. You go, oh, Grace, I was just joking. And now I look like the jerk face. Right. So that's how jokes can work. And so people like Daniel Ricardo use joking not as like, a, ha ha ha, we're all bonding. I'm telling this funny story. He uses it as a way to like undermined people and then if he gets called out on it, he's like oh i was i was just joking we were having a fun time lando he's my buddy so that's why i think lando norris is actually keith moon because he is legitimately that guy where's daniel ricardo that's just kind of the character he plays yes that's daniel how that ricardo all with the facade together. yes i like it all right let's do some mailbag you've got mail um okay corin Graustra. I hope I have pronounced that correctly. That uh, if not, she'll kill me. Um, so yeah. apologies, but I think I'm close-ish. So a anyway, great question says, hey guys and Grace, uh, can you speak to the effect of driver weight on the arrow? If teams are stripping off paint to save a few grams, what happens when the drivers drink an X glass of water and they're a few ounces heavier, et cetera, or hotter over the weekend and they start to uh, the race uh, lighter than planned? Uh, on that note, any insight into how each team accommodates the weight of their driver in relation to the total car weight regulations? Do the regs address driver weight at all? And then she said, P.S. I always look forward to the episodes. Love uh, that you guys give consistent off-week content to help make those uh, weeks a bit more bearable. Uh, thanks for all the hard work you put into each episode. It doesn't go unnoticed. Well, thank you, Corin. Um, and then P.P.S. She says, Alvin's cats uh wins segment of the podcast excellent <laughs> so, uh right. she goes i can't wait to hear your thoughts all right so it's a great question Corey, sure is. about weight um a few years ago driver weight was absolutely at play mm -hmm. in reducing the overall weight of the car um, because they didn't really make a distinction they just gave an overall weight of the car and the lighter you could get a driver um you let me put it this way i'm going to use round numbers these numbers are way off i'm just going to use round numbers so let's say that the car total could weigh 600. uh if you with a driver in it um if you could get a driver that was 20 less then you could put that additional 20 somewhere else right. in that car right. as ballast, right? Which would help the car perform much better in corners or whatever. So they had this total, but what, what happened was, is it became this real issue because um, you started to see drivers on extreme diets and they were starving themselves so they would have as little impact as possible to overall weight of the car and allow for balance to be moved around. Mark Weber, who was a tall guy, was incredibly skinny, unhealthily so I would argue, and it became a real issue about driver health in the FIA um, because you had 
a lot of um, a lot of stick and ball athletes and all that that were going through a lot of you know weight uh, struggles and those kind of things. And then the the focus was on Formula One about that, but they, they had drivers that were way way thin, you know. Um, so it became an advantage to have a thin driver and and a shorter driver, right? And I remember, was it? Um, I remember Ron Dennis. Ah, uh, was it Ron? Nice, Ron. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit more of the story. Yes, I think it was Ron when Hulkenberg was looking for a ride who said, oh, no, he's oh. he's too tall, you yeah, know, meaning I he can. was too big, right? right? And and that sort of thing. So anyway, in answer to your question, to make a long story longer, um, so the FIA stopped all that nonsense by setting a minimum driver weight of 80 kilograms. Uh, and that is to prevent the drivers or the teams from demanding that the drivers lose more and more weight. Now, they weigh the drivers, uh, they add that to the total car weight, and that's what they're measured on. Um, so now the minimum weight of the car can be no less than 798 kilograms without fuel, but with the driver. So the package is 798 kilograms with driver, and that means that 80 kilograms of that 798 at least have to come from the driver. So right? is this where we get to talk about why they have to be weighed every race? Because a certain driver used to be weighed at the beginning of the race and then would lose weight during the rest of the races. Yeah. And so then your cars would be lighter. Right. So I'm going to, I don't mention it, but I'm going to let you mention that. So, so oh, thanks. of the 798, 80 kilograms of that, has to be from the driver so that's the minimum weight a driver can weigh if the driver weighs less than 80 kilograms then the team does have to add ballast at a specific location right. to make up the difference that's why driver's weight is directly tied to the car weight it's also why they weigh the driver separately so they can make sure that the team have added the correct amount of weight should the driver be under 80 kilograms and they want to make sure that every that whole package so if the car at the end of the race, if they weigh the driver, they weigh the car, they add those two numbers together, and it's greater than 798 kilograms, then that's fine. Uh, but but that minimum driver weight prevents them from demanding that drivers unhealthily get super thin in order to save weight. So go ahead, Grace. And they used to only weigh the drivers at the beginning of the season. And one Michael Schumacher seem to always weigh less later in the season. So that's why they now weigh them at every race at the end yeah. of the race and not just once in the beginning of the year. So right. I think that uh, it would be fun. They do um, like unusual rules in other sports. Uh, but I, I think there are many rules that would be like, this was done because of Michael Schumacher. And so this was yet another <laughs> rule that was done because of Michael Schumacher right. and uh, his like skirt and the rules, which I guess is part of the game, but you know, yeah, it is. Push you weigh them all the time. That's right. That's right. So anyway. All right. Well, that does it for this podcast. That's what we think about all the news this week. Let us know what you think about it as well. You can do that by going to theparkforme.com, leaving your opinion there. Just do it to Corman Civility. If you like the podcast, go to iTunes. Give us a good rating. Give us some love over there. A huge thank you to our Patreon supporters. And I just sent you guys all a thank you. Uh, message over the weekend and uh, uh, we could not and would not do this podcast without you at all um, so we're incredibly grateful for your support um, and we have the Spanish Grand Prix coming up next weekend so I'm gonna have to try to find Paul to review that Good coming luck. off coming off not a fun race at Mid Ohio oh, no. it must yeah, I must admit they needed a last lap uh, uh, splash and go on oh, on fuel and they dropped him from fifth to eighth i think it was tough so anyway um i'll find paul and we'll talk All about right. the spanish grand prix and you know where the spanish grand prix is Barcelona! that's where it is all right until next week this is todd aka negative camera saying so long grace see you in two weeks that's it man game over man it's game over